The Winds of Winter Elaine She was reading her little lord a tale of the winged knight when Maya Stone came knocking on the door of his bedchamber, clad in boots and riding leathers and smelling strongly of the stable. Maya had straw in her hair and a scowl on her face. That scowl comes of having Meekle Redfort near, Elaine knew. Your lordship, Maya informed Lord Robert, Lady Wainwood's banners have been seen an hour down the road. She will be here soon with your cousin Harry. Will you want to greet them? Why did she have to mention Harry? Elaine thought. We will never get sweet Robin out of bed now. The boy slapped a pillow. Send them away! I never asked them here. Maya looked nonplussed. No one in the Vale was better at handling a mule, but lordlings were another matter. They were invited, she said uncertainly. For the tourney, I don't... Elaine closed her book. Thank you, Maya. Let me talk with Lord Robert, if you would. Relief plain on her face, Maya fled without another word. I hate that Harry, sweet Robin said when she was gone. He calls me cousin, but he's just waiting for me to die so he can take the eerie. He thinks I don't know, but I do. Your lordship should not believe such nonsense, Elaine said. I'm sure Sir Harold loves you well. And if the gods are good, he will love me too. Her tummy gave a little flutter. He doesn't. Lord Robert insisted. He wants my father's castle, that's all, so he pretends. The boy clutched the blanket to his pimply chest. I don't want you to marry him, Elaine. I am the Lord of the Eyrie and I forbid it. He sounded as if he were about to cry. You should marry me instead. We could sleep in the same bed every night and you could read me stories. No man can wed me so long as my dwarf husband still lives somewhere in this world. Queen Circe had collected the heads of a dozen dwarves, Peter claimed, but none were Tyrians. Sweet Robin, you must not say such things. You are the Lord of the Eyrie and Defender of the Vale, and you must wed a high-born lady and father a son to sit in the high hall of House Aaron after you are gone. Robert wiped his nose. But I want... She put a finger to his lips. I know what you want, but it cannot be. I am no fit wife for you. I am bastard born. I don't care. I love you best of anyone. You are such a little fool. Your lord's bannermen will care. Some call my father up jumped and ambitious. If you were to take me to wife, they would say that he made you do it, that it was no will of yours. The Lord's declarant might take arms against him once again, and he and I should both be put to death. I wouldn't let them hurt you, Lord Robert said. If they try, I will make them all fly. His hands began to tremble. Elaine stroked his fingers. There, my sweet Robin. Be still now. When the shaking passed, she said, You must have a proper wife, a true-born maid of noble birth. No, I want to marry you, Elaine. Once your lady mother intended that very thing. But I was true-born then, and noble. My lord is kind to say so. Elaine smoothed his hair. Lady Lysa had never let the servants touch it. And after she had died, Robert had suffered terrible shaking fits whenever anyone came near him with a blade, so it had been allowed to grow until it tumbled over his round shoulders and halfway down his flabby white chest. He does have pretty hair. If the gods are good and he lives long enough to wed, his wife will admire his hair, surely. That much she will love about him. Any child of ours would be base-born. Only a true-born child of House Aaron can displace Sir Harold as your heir. My father will find a proper wife for you, some high-born girl much prettier than me. You'll hunt and hawk together, 
and she'll give you her favor to wear in tournaments. Before long, you will have forgotten me entirely. I won't! You will. You must. Her voice was firm, but gentle. The Lord of the Eerie can do as he likes. Can I still love you, even if I have to marry her? Sir Harold has a common woman. Benjacott says she's carrying his bastard. Benjacott should learn to keep his fool's mouth shut. Is that what you would have for me? A bastard? She pulled her fingers from his grasp. Would you dishonor me that way? The boy looked stricken. No, I never meant... Elaine stood. If it please, my lord, I must go and find my father. Someone needs to greet Lady Wainwood. Before her little lord could find the words to protest, she gave him a quick curtsy and fled the bedchamber, sweeping down the hall and across a covered bridge to the Lord Protector's apartments. When she had left Peter Baelish that morning, he had been breaking his fast with old Oswell, who had arrived last night from Goldtown on a lathered horse. She hoped they might still be talking, but Peter's solar proved empty. Someone had left a window open and a stack of papers had blown onto the floor. The sun was slanting through the thick yellow windows, and dust motes danced on the light like tiny golden insects. Though snow had blanketed the heights of the giant's lance above, below the mountain the autumn lingered, and winter wheat was ripening in the fields. Outside the window she could hear the laughter of the washerwomen at the well, the din of steel on steel from the ward where the knights were at their drills. Good sounds. Elaine loved it here. She felt alive again. For the first time since her father since Lord Eddard Stark had died. She closed the window, gathered up the fallen papers, and stacked them on the table. One was a list of competitors. Four and sixty knights had been invited to vie for places amongst Lord Robert Aaron's new Brotherhood of Winged Knights, and four and sixty knights had come to tilt for the right to wear falcon's wings upon their war helms and guard their lord. The competitors came from all over the Vale, from the mountain valleys and the coast, from Gulltown and the Bloody Gate, even the three sisters. Though a few were promised, only three were wed. The eight victors would be expected to spend the next three years at Lord Robert's side, as his own personal guard. Elaine had suggested seven, like the King's Guard, but Sweet Robin had insisted that he must have more knights than King Tommen. So older men with wives and children had not been invited. And they came, Elaine thought proudly. They all came. It had fallen out just as Peter said it would, the day the ravens flew. They're young, eager, hungry for adventure and renown. Lysa would not let them go to war. This is the next best thing. A chance to serve their lord and prove their prowess. They will come. Even Harry the heir. He had smoothed her hair and kissed her forehead. What a clever daughter you are. It was clever. The tourney, the prizes, the winged knights. It had all been her own notion. Lord Robert's mother had filled him full of fears, but he always took care courage from the tale she read him of Sir Artis Aaron, the winged knight of legend, founder of his line. Why not surround him with winged knights? She had thought one night, after Sweet Robin had finally drifted off to sleep. His own king's guard, to keep him safe and make him brave. And no sooner did she tell Peter her idea than he went out and made it happen. He will want to be there to greet Sir Harold. Where could he have gone? Elaine swept down the tower stairs to enter the pillared gallery at the back of the great hall. Below her, serving men were setting up trestle tables for the evening feast, while their wives and daughters swept up the old rushes and scattered fresh ones. Lord Nestor was showing Lady Waxley his prized tapestries, with their scenes of hunt and chase. The same panels had once hung in the Red Keep of King's Landing when Robert sat the Iron Throne. Joffrey had taken them down, and they had languished in some cellar until Peter Baelish arranged for them to be brought to the Vale as a gift for Nestor Royce. Not only were the hangings beautiful, 
but the high steward delighted in telling anyone who'd listen that they had once belonged to a king. Peter was not in the great hall. Elaine crossed the gallery and descended the stair built into the thick west wall to come out in the inner ward, where the jousting would be held. Viewing stands had been raised for all those who had come to watch, with four long tilting barriers in between. Lord Nestor's men were painting the barriers with whitewash, draping the strands with bright banners, and hanging shields on the gate the competitors would pass through when they made their entrance. At the north end of the yard, three quintains had been set up, and some of the competitors were riding at them. Elaine knew them by their shields. The bells of Belmore, green vipers for the Linderleys, the red sledge of Breakstone, House Tollet's black and grey pilly, Sir Meikle Redfort set one quintain spinning with a perfectly placed blow. He was one of those favored to win wings. Peter was not at the quintains, nor anywhere else in the yard, but as she turned to go, a woman's voice called out. Elaine! cried Miranda Royce from a carved stone bench beneath a beech tree, where she was seated between two men. She looked in need of rescue. Smiling, Elaine walked toward her friend. Miranda was wearing a grey woolen dress, a green hooded cloak, and a rather desperate look. On either side of her sat a knight. The one on her right had a grizzled beard, a bald head, and a belly that spilled over his sword belt where his lap should have been. The one on her left was no more than eighteen and skinny as a spear. His ginger-colored whiskers only partially served to disguise the angry red pimples that dotted his face. The bald knight wore a dark blue surcoat emblazoned with a huge pair of pink lips. The pimply ginger lad countered with nine white seagulls on a field of brown, which marked him for a shet of Goldtown. He was staring so intently at Miranda's breasts that he hardly noticed Elaine until Miranda rose to hug her. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Randa whispered in her ear, before she turned to say, Sirs, may I present you the Lady Elaine Stone? The Lord Protector's daughter, the bald knight announced, all hearty gallantry. He rose ponderously. And full as lovely as the tales told of her, I see. Not to be outdone, the pimply knight hopped up and said, Sir Ossifer speaks truly. You are the most beautiful maid in all the seven kingdoms. It might have been a sweeter courtesy had he not addressed it to her chest. And have you seen all those maids yourself, sir? Elaine asked him. You are young to be so widely traveled. He blushed, which only made his pimples look angrier. No, my lady. I am from Goldtown, and I am not, though Elaine was born there. She would need to be careful around this one. I remember Goldtown fondly, she told him, with a smile as vague as it was pleasant. To Miranda, she said, Do you know where my father's gotten to, perchance? Let me take you to him, my lady. I do hope you will forgive me for depriving you of Lady Miranda's company. Elaine told the knights. She did not wait for a reply, but took the older girl arm in arm and drew her away from the bench. Only when they were out of earshot did she whisper, Do you really know where my father is? Of course not. Walk faster. My new suitors may be following. Miranda made a face. Ossifer Lips is the dullest knight in the Vale. But Uther Shet aspires to his laurels. I am praying they fight a duel for my hand and kill each other. Elaine giggled. Surely Lord Nestor would not seriously entertain a suit from such men. Oh, he might. My lord father is annoyed with me for killing my last husband and putting him to all this trouble. It was not your fault he died. There was no one else in the bed that I recall. Elaine could not help but shudder. Miranda's husband had died when he was making love with her. Those sister men who came in yesterday were gallant, she said, to change the subject. If you don't like Sir Ossifer or Sir Uther, marry one of them instead. I thought the youngest one was very handsome. 
the one in the sealskin cloak, Randa said, incredulous. One of his brothers, then. Miranda rolled her eyes. They're from the sisters. Did you ever know a sister man who could joust? They clean their swords with codfish oil and wash in tubs of cold seawater. Well, Elaine said, at least they're clean. Some of them have webs between their toes. I'd sooner marry Lord Peter. Then I'd be your mother. How little is his finger, I ask you? Elaine did not dignify that question with an answer. Lady Wainwood will be here soon with her sons. Is that a promise or a threat? Miranda said. The first Lady Wainwood must have been a mare, I think. How else to explain why all the Wainwood men are horse-faced? If I were ever to wed a Wainwood, I would make him swear a holy vow to don his helm whenever he wished to fuck me, and keep the visor closed. She gave Elaine a pinch on the arm. My Harry will be with them, though. I notice that you left him out. I shall never forgive you for stealing him away from me. He's the boy I want to marry. The betrothal was my father's doing, Elaine protested, as she had a hundred times before. She is only teasing, she told herself, but behind the japes she could hear the hurt. Miranda stopped to gaze across the yard at the knights at their practice. Now there's the very sort of husband I need. A few feet away, two knights were fighting with blunted practice swords. Their blades crashed together twice, then slipped past each other only to be blocked by upraised shields, but the bigger man gave ground at the impact. Elaine could not see the front of his shield from where he stood, but his attacker bore three ravens in flight, each clutching a red heart in its claws. Three hearts and three ravens. She knew right then how the fight would end. A few moments later, and the big man sprawled dazed in the dust with his helm askew. When his squire undid the fastenings to bare his head, there was blood trickling down his scalp. If the swords had not been blunted, there would be brains as well. That last head blow had been so hard Elaine had winced in sympathy when it fell. Miranda Royce considered the victor thoughtfully. Do you think if I ask nicely... Sir Lynn would kill my suitors for me? He might, for a plump bag of gold. Sir Lynn Corbray was forever desperately short of coin. All the Vale knew that. Alas, all I have is a plump pair of teats. Though with Sir Lynn a plump sausage under my skirts would serve me better. Elaine's giggle drew Corbray's attention. He handed his shield to his loudish squire, removed his helm and quilted coif. Ladies. His long brown hair was plastered to his brow by sweat. Well struck, Sir Lynn, Elaine called out, though I fear you've knocked poor Sir Owen insensible. Corbray glanced back to where his foe was being helped from the yard by his squire. He had no sense to start with, or he should not have tried me. There is truth in that, Elaine thought but some demon of mischief was in her that morning, so she gave Sir Lynn a thrust of her own. Smiling sweetly, she said, My lord father tells me your brother's new wife is with child. Corbray gave her a dark look. Lionel sends his regrets. He remains at heart's home with his peddler's daughter, watching her belly swell as if he were the first man who ever got a wench pregnant. Oh, that's an open wound, thought Elaine. Lionel Corbray's first wife had given him nothing but a frail, sickly babe who died in infancy, and during all those years Sir Lynn had remained his brother's heir. When the poor woman finally died, however, Peter Baelish had stepped in and brokered a new marriage for Lord Corbray. The second Lady Corbray was sixteen, the daughter of a wealthy Goldtown merchant but she had come with an immense dowry, and men said she was a tall, strapping, healthy girl, with big breasts and good wide hips. And fertile, too, it seems. 
We are all praying that the mother grants Lady Corbray an easy labor and a healthy child, said Miranda. Elaine could not help herself. She smiled and said, My father is always pleased to be of service to one of Lord Robert's leal bannermen. I'm sure he would be most delighted to help broker a marriage for you as well, Sir Lynn. How kind of him. Corbray's lips drew back in something that might have been meant as a smile, though it gave Elaine a chill. But what need have I for heirs when I am landless and like to remain so, thanks to our Lord Protector? No, tell your Lord Father I eat none of his brood mares. The venom in his voice was so thick that for a moment she almost forgot that Lynn Corbray was actually her father's cat's paw bought and paid for. Or was he? Perhaps instead of being Peter's man pretending to be Peter's foe, he was actually his foe pretending to be his man pretending to be his foe. Just thinking about it was enough to make her head spin. Elaine turned abruptly from the yard and bumped into a short, sharp-faced man with a brush of orange hair who had come up behind her. His hand shot out and caught her arm before she could fall. My lady, my pardons if I took you unawares. The fault was mine. I did not see you standing there. We mice are quiet creatures. Sir Shadrich was so short he might have been taken for a squire, but his face belonged to a much older man. She saw long leagues and the wrinkles at the corners of his mouth, old battles in the scar beneath his ear, and a hardness behind the eyes that no boy would ever have. This was a man grown. Even Randa overtopped him, though. Will you be seeking wings? The Royce girl said. A mouse with wings would be a silly sight. Perhaps you will try the melee instead, Elaine suggested. The melee was an afterthought, a sop for all the brothers, uncles, fathers, and friends who had accompanied the competitors to the gates of the moon to see them win their silver wings. But there would be prizes for the champions and a chance to win ransoms. A good melee is all a hedge knight can hope for, unless he stumbles on a bag of dragons. And that's not likely, is it? I suppose not. But now you must excuse us, sir. We need to find my lord father. Horn sounded from atop the wall. Too late, Miranda said. They're here. We shall need to do the honors by ourselves. She grinned. Last one to the gate must marry Uther Shet. They made a race of it, dashing headlong across the yard and past the stables, skirts flapping, whilst knights and serving men alike looked on, and pigs and chickens scattered before them. It was most unladylike, but Elaine soon found herself laughing. For just a little while, as she ran, she forgot who she was, and where, and found herself remembering bright cold days at Winterfell. When she would race through the castle with her friend Jane Poole, with Arya running after them trying to keep up. By the time they arrived at the gatehouse, both of them were red-faced and panting. Miranda had lost her cloak somewhere along the way. They were just in time. The portcullis had been raised, and a column of riders twenty strong were passing underneath. At their head rode Anya Wainwood, Lady of Iron Oaks, stern and slim her grey-brown hair bound up in a scarf. Her riding cloak was heavy green wool trimmed with brown fur and clasped at the throat by a yellow brooch in the shape of the broken wheel of her house. Miranda Royce stepped forward and sketched a curtsy. Lady Anya, welcome to the gates of the moon. Lady Miranda, Lady Elaine. Anya Wainwood inclined her head to each of them in turn. It is good of you to greet us. Allow me to present my grandson, Sir Roland Wainwood. She nodded at the knight who had spoken. And this is my youngest son, Sir Wallace Wainwood. And of course my ward, Sir Harold Harding. Harry the heir, Elaine thought. My husband-to-be, if you will have me. A sudden terror filled her. She wondered if her face was red. Don't stare at him, she reminded herself. Don't stare, don't gape, don't gawk, look away. 
Her hair must be a frightful mess after all that running. It took all her will to stop herself from trying to tuck the loose strands back into place. Never mind your stupid hair. Your hair doesn't matter. It's him that matters. Him and the Wayne Woods. Sir Roland was the oldest of the three, though no more than five and twenty. He was taller and more muscular than Sir Wallace, but both were long-faced and lantern-jawed, with stringy brown hair and pinched noses. Horse-faced and homely, Elaine thought. Harry, though. My Harry, my lord, my lover, my betrothed. Sir Harold Harding looked every inch a lord-in-waiting, clean-limbed and handsome, straight as a lance, hard with muscle. Men old enough to have known John Aaron in his youth said Sir Harold had his look, she knew. He had a mop of sandy blonde hair, pale blue eyes, an aquiline nose. Joffrey was comely too, though, she reminded herself. A comely monster. That's what he was. Little Lord Tyrion was kinder, twisted though he was. Harry was staring at her. He knows who I am, she realized, and he does not seem pleased to see me. It was only then that she took note of his heraldry. Though his surcoat and horse trappings were patterned in the red and white diamonds of House Harding, his shield was quartered. The arms of Harding and Wainwood were displayed in the first and third quarters, respectively, but in the second and fourth quarters he bore the moon and falcon of House Aaron, sky blue and cream. Sweet Robin will not like that. Sir Wallace said, Are we the l l last You are, sirs, replied Miranda Royce, taking absolutely no notice of his stammer. When will the t t t t tilts commence? Oh, soon, I pray, said Randa. Some of the competitors have been here for almost a moon's turn, partaking of my father's meat and mead. All good fellows and very brave. But they do eat rather a lot. The Wainwoods laughed, and even Harry the Air cracked a thin smile. It was snowing in the passes, else we would have been here sooner, said Lady Anya. Had we known such beauty awaited us at the gates, we would have flown, Sir Roland said. Though his words were addressed to Miranda Royce, he smiled at Elaine as he said them. To fly you would need wings, Randa replied, and there are some knights here who might have a thing to say concerning that. I look forward to a spirited discussion. Sir Roland swung down from his horse, turned to Elaine, and smiled. I had heard that Lord Littlefinger's daughter was fair of face and full of grace, but no one ever told me that she was a thief. You wrong me, sir. I am no thief. Sir Roland placed his hand over his heart. Then how do you explain this hole in my chest? From whence you stole my heart. He is only t t t teasing you, my lady, stammered Sir Wallace. My n n n nephew never had a heart. The Wainwood wheel as its broken spoke, and we have my uncle here. Sir Roland gave Wallace a whap behind the ear. Squires should be quiet when knights are speaking. Sir Wallace reddened. I am no more a s s squire, my lady. My n nephew knows full well that I was g g n n dubbed. Elaine suggested gently. Dubbed, said Wallace Wainwood gratefully. Rob would be his age if he was still alive. She could not help but think. But Rob died a king, and this is just a boy. My lord father has assigned you rooms in the East Tower, Lady Miranda was telling Lady Wainwood. But I fear your knights will need to share a bed. The gates of the moon were never meant to house so many noble visitors. You were in the Falcon Tower, Sir Harold, Elaine put in. Far away from sweet Robin. 
That was intentional, she knew. Peter Baelish did not leave such things to chance. If it please you, I will show you to your chambers myself. This time her eyes met Harry's. She smiled just for him, and said a silent prayer to the maiden. Please, he doesn't need to love me. Just make him like me. Just a little. That would be enough for now. Sir Harold looked down at her coldly. Why should it please me to be escorted anywhere by Littlefinger's bastard? All three Wainwoods looked at him askance. You are a guest here, Harry, Lady Anya reminded him in a frosty voice. See that you remember that. A lady's armor is her courtesy. Elaine could feel the blood rushing to her face. No tears, she prayed. Please, please, I must not cry. As you wish, sir. And now, if you will excuse me, Littlefinger's bastard must find her lord father and let him know that you have come, so we can begin the tourney on the morrow. And may your horse stumble, Harry the heir, so you fall on your stupid head in your first tilt. She showed the Wainwoods a stone face as they blurted out awkward apologies for their companions. When they were done, she turned and fled. Near the keep, she ran headlong into Sir Lothor Brune and almost knocked him off his feet. Harry the heir? Harry the arse, I say. He's just some up-jumped squire. Elaine was so grateful that she hugged him. Thank you. Have you seen my father, sir? Down in the vaults, Sir Lothar said, inspecting Lord Nestor's granaries with Lord Grafton and Belmore. The vaults were large and dark and filthy. Elaine lit a taper and clutched her skirt as she made the descent. Near the bottom, she heard Lord Grafton's booming voice and followed. The merchants are clamoring to buy, and the lords are clamoring to sell, the gold towner was saying when she found them. Though not a tall man, Grafton was wide, with thick arms and shoulders. His hair was a dirty blonde mop. How am I to stop that, my lord? Post guardsmen on the docks. If need be, seize the ships. How does not matter, so long as no food leaves the Vale? These prices, though, protested fat Lord Belmore. These prices are more than fair. You say more than fair, my lord. I say less than we would wish. Wait, if need be, buy the food yourself and keep it stored. Winter is coming. Prices must go higher. Perhaps, said Belmore, doubtfully. Bronzion will not wait, Grafton complained. He need not ship through Gull Town. He has his own ports. Whilst we are hoarding our harvest, Royce and the other lords to Clarence will turn theirs into silver. You may be sure of that. Let us hope so, said Peter. When their granaries are empty, they will need every scrap of that silver to buy sustenance from us. And now, if you will excuse me, my lord, it would seem my daughter has need of me. Lady Elaine, Lord Grafton said. You look bright-eyed this morning. You are kind to say so, my lord. Father, I am sorry to disturb you, but I thought you would want to know that the Wainwoods have arrived. And is Sir Harold with them? Horrible Sir Harold. He is. Lord Belmore laughed. I never thought Royce would let him come. Is he blind or merely stupid? He is honorable. Sometimes it amounts to the same thing. If he denied the lad the chance to prove himself, it would create a rift between them. So why not let him tilt? The boy is no wise skilled enough to win a place amongst the winged knights. I suppose not, said Belmore, grudgingly. Lord Grafton kissed Elaine on the hand, and the two lords went off, leaving her alone with her lord father. Come, Peter said. Walk with me. 
he took her by the arm and led her deeper into the vaults, past an empty dungeon. And how was your first meeting with Harry the heir? He's horrible. The world is full of horrors, sweet. By now you ought to know that. You've seen enough of them. Yes, she said. But why must he be so cruel? He called me your bastard, right in the yard in front of everyone. So far as he knows, that's who you are. This betrothal was never his idea, and Bronze Yawn has no doubt warned him against my wiles. You were my daughter. He does not trust you, and he believes that you're beneath him. Well, I'm not. He may think he's some great knight, but Sir Lothor says he's just some up-jumped squire. Peter put his arm around her. So he is. But he is Robert's heir as well. Bringing Harry here was the first step in our plan. But now we need to keep him. And only you can do that. He has a weakness for a pretty face. And whose face is prettier than yours? Charm him. Entrance him. Bewitch him. I don't know how, she said miserably. Oh, I think you do, said Littlefinger, with one of those smiles that did not reach his eyes. You will be the most beautiful woman in the hall tonight, as lovely as your lady mother at your age. I cannot seat you on the dais, but you'll have a place of honor above the salt and underneath a wall sconce. The fire will be shining in your hair, so everyone will see how fair a face you are. Keep a good long spoon on hand to beat the squires off, sweetling. You will not want green boys underfoot when the knights come round to beg you for your favor. Who would ask to wear a bastard's favor? Harry, if he has the wits the gods gave a goose. But do not give it to him. Choose some other gallant and favor him instead. You do not want to seem too eager. No, Elaine said. Lady Wainwood will insist that Harry dance with you. I can promise you that much. That will be your chance. Smile at the boy. Touch him when you speak. Tease him to pike his pride. If he seems to be responding... Tell him that you are feeling faint, and ask him to take you outside for a breath of fresh air. No knight could refuse such a request from a fair maiden. Yes, she said. But he thinks that I'm a bastard. A beautiful bastard, and the Lord Protector's daughter. Peter drew her close and kissed her on both cheeks. The knight belongs to you, sweetling. Remember that, always. I'll try, father, she said. The feast proved to be everything her father promised. Sixty-four dishes were served, in honor of the sixty-four competitors who had come so far to contest for silver wings before their lord. From the rivers and the lakes came pike and trout and salmon. From the seas, crabs and cod and herring. Ducks there were, and capons peacocks in their plumage, and swans in almond milk. Suckling pigs were served up crackling with apples in their mouths, and three huge aurochs were roasted whole above the fire pits in the castle yard, since they were too big to get through the kitchen doors. Loaves of hot bread filled the trestle tables in Lord Nestor's halls, and massive wheels of cheese were brought up from the vaults. The butter was fresh churned, and there were leeks and carrots, roasted onions, beets, turnips, parsnips. And best of all, Lord Nestor's cooks prepared a splendid subtlety, a lemon cake in the shape of the giant's lance, twelve feet tall and adorned with an eerie made of sugar. For me, Elaine thought, as they wheeled it out. Sweet Robin loved lemon cakes, too, but only after she told him that they were her favorites. The cake had required every lemon in the vale, but Peter had promised that he would send to Dorne for more. There were gifts as well. Splendid gifts. 
Each of the competitors received a cloak of cloth of silver and a lapis brooch in the shape of a pair of falcon's wings. Fine steel daggers were given to the brothers, fathers, and friends who had come to watch them tilt. For their mothers, sisters, and ladies fair, there were bolts of silk and mirish lace. Lord Nestor has an open hand, Elaine heard Sir Edmund Breakstone say. An open hand and a little finger, Lady Wainwood replied, with a nod toward Peter Baelish. Breakstone was not slow to take her meaning. The true source of this largesse was not Lord Nestor, but the Lord Protector. When the last course had been served and cleared, the tables were lifted from their trestles to clear the floor for dancing, and musicians were brought in. "'Are there no singers?' asked Ben Coldwater. "'The little lord cannot abide them,' Sir Lyman Linderly replied. "'Not since Merillion. "'Ah, that was the man who murdered Lady Lysa, yes?' Elaine spoke up. His singing pleased her greatly, and she showed him too much favor, perhaps. When she wed my father, he went mad and pushed her out the moon door. Lord Robert has hated singing ever since. He is still fond of music, though. As am I, Coldwater said. Rising, he offered Elaine his hand. Would you honor me with this dance, my lady? You're very kind she said, as he led her to the floor. He was her first partner of the evening, but far from the last. Just as Peter had promised, the young knights flocked around her, vying for her favor. After Ben came Andrew Tollett, handsome Sir Byron, red-nosed Sir Morgarth, and Sir Shadrich the Mad Mouse, then Sir Albar Royce, Miranda's stout, dull brother and Lord Nestor's heir. She danced with all three Sunderlands, none of whom had webs between their fingers, though she could not vouch for their toes. Uther Shet appeared to pay her slimy compliments as he trod upon her feet, but Sir Targon the Half-Wild proved to be the soul of courtesy. After that, Sir Roland Wainwood swept her up and made her laugh with mocking comments about half the other knights in the hall. His uncle Wallace took a turn as well and tried to do the same, but the words would not come. Elaine finally took pity on him and began to chatter happily, to spare him the embarrassment. When the dance was done, she excused herself and went back to her place to have a drink of wine. And there he stood, Harry the heir himself, tall, handsome, scowling. Lady Elaine, may I partner you in this dance? She considered for a moment. No, I don't think so. Color rose to his cheeks. I was unforgivably rude to you in the yard. You must forgive me. Must? She tossed her hair, took a sip of wine, made him wait. How can you forgive someone who is unforgivably rude? Will you explain that to me, sir? Sir Harold looked confused. Please... One dance. Charm him, entrance him, bewitch him. If you insist. He nodded, offered his arm, led her out onto the floor. As they waited for the music to resume, Elaine glanced at the dais, where Lord Robert sat staring at them. Please, she prayed, don't let him start to twitch and shake. Not here. Not now. Maester Colmon would have made certain that he drank a strong dose of sweet milk before the feast, but even so. Then the musicians took up a tune, and she was dancing. Say something, she urged herself. You will never make Sir Harry love you if you don't have the courage to talk to him. Should she tell him what a good dancer he was? No, he's probably heard that a dozen times tonight. Besides, Peter said that I should not seem eager. Instead, she said, I have heard that you are about to be a father. It was not something most girls would say to their almost betrothed, but she wanted to see if Sir Harold would lie. For the second time, my daughter Alice is two years old. Your bastard daughter Alice, Elaine thought. But what she said was, 
That one had a different mother, though. Yes, Sissy was a pretty thing when I tumbled her, but childbirth left her as fat as a cow, so Lady Anya arranged for her to marry one of her men-at-arms. It is different with Saffron. Saffron? Elaine tried not to laugh. Truly? Sir Harold had the grace to blush. Her father says she is more precious to him than gold. He's rich, the richest man in Gold Town, a fortune in spices. What will you name the babe? she asked. Cinnamon if she's a girl, cloves if he's a boy. That almost made him stumble. My Lady Japes, oh no. Peter will howl when I tell him what I said. Saffron is very beautiful, I'll have you know. Tall and slim with big brown eyes and hair like honey. Elaine raised her head. More beautiful than me? Sir Harold studied her face. You are comely enough, I grant you. When Lady Anya first told me of this match, I was afraid that you might look like your father. Little pointy beard and all? Elaine laughed. I never meant. I hope you joust better than you talk. For a moment he looked shocked, but as the song was ending he burst into a laugh. No one told me you were clever. He has good teeth, she thought, straight and white, and when he smiles he has the nicest dimples. She ran one finger down his cheek. Should we ever wed, you'll have to send Saffron back to her father. I'll be all the spice you'll want. He grinned. I will hold you to that promise, my lady. Until that day, may I wear your favor in the tourney? You may not. It is promised to... another. She was not sure who as yet, but she knew she would find someone. <laughs>